Welcome. I'm Julie Thompson, Executive Director of PAC TV, and today we're hosting our last COVID-19 update on Thursday for the Town of Pembroke. We have been hosting these every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. Watch in Pembroke on Comcast Channel 15 or online on our streaming channel, pactv.org slash live. To ask questions during this forum, please email them to pembrokeinfo at pactv.org. For replay schedules of this and all the forums, please visit pactv.org slash pembroke. Sabrina Chilcott, Pembroke's Assistant Town Manager, will moderate the forum and will introduce the participants that are contributing today. Welcome, Sabrina. Good morning, Julie. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, as you can see, we're getting phone calls and we're back in the office. So I wanted to do a few quick updates. Um, the town manager announced to the Board of Selectmen a few things last night. And I'm sorry, I'll get the message on that and call you back, I promise. Um, so as we go into our last uh, update here, it's because generally speaking, phase one reopening plans involve returning to a set of responsibilities that now um, bring some of the non forefront. So just this quick update, employees in the town of Pembroke who had otherwise been working remotely or um, in some other way uh, contributing to the, to the town have returned to their offices and their workplaces today. You will be able to get people on the phone, but you will not yet be able to enter the buildings. Uh, we, the Board of Selectmen was updated last night by the town manager that Pembroke Town Hall will reopen on Monday, June 1st at 8.30 a.m. There are significant new protocols in place and the signs will be posted around the building regarding the wearing of facial coverings and the requirement to socially distance. The town has installed some plexiglass shields at the common um, points of service for the public. Uh, employees will be wearing facial coverings when working with the public and when they are unable to socially distance in some common area of the building or in their own offices. Um, the schedule for the town hall in the upcoming week and potentially more than one week will be weekdays from 8.30 to 4.30. No evening hours at this stage of the reopening plan. Uh, the town manager also let the town residents know that the Pembroke Public Library is going to begin curbside service of uh, pickup of reading materials at the library. So you can reach out to the Pembroke Public Library either through their website at pembrokepubliclibrary.org or via telephone at 781-293-6771 and arrange for a time to pick up your um, periodicals. The Additionally, the Council on Aging will resume transportation of seniors and the otherwise able to things like grocery shopping, to pharmacy trips for pickups, and for medical appointments at this time. There are many new protocols and changes to the ride structure that you're going to want to be aware of, so please reach out to the Senior Center at 781-294-8220. The final pieces of note for folks who may be tuning in, uh, the Board of Selectmen last night postponed annual town meeting for by one week at this point in time to the date of June 23rd. They reserve the right to revisit that next week. Um, there are some issues that were raised by Pembroke Emergency Management in terms of the execution of a town meeting. And if you would like to tune in and follow along with the, uh, with the conversation and participate in this dialogue, if you tune in via Channel 15 on Comcast to uh, Wednesday, June 3rd at 7 p.m. or you can live stream the meeting on pactv.org backslash live. Um, please do follow along with that dialogue. It's important. It's your annual town meeting. And finally, the town elections have not been postponed. They will go off on June 20 as scheduled. The polling hours are from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Please contact the town clerk's office for your absentee ballot if you'd prefer to vote uh, otherwise than in person. And you can reach them on the town website at www.pembroke-ma.gov or by phone at 781-293-7211. Forgive me, 293-7211. So um, that's pretty much the news of note. Uh, as we get back into our offices and our uh, surroundings and navigate them using our um, facial coverings and our uh, protocols that are posted here at town hall, um, and are required to be followed by staff and the public. Um, we realize the need to return to some degree of normal operations while keeping an emergency management component alive. Um, so in that interest today as a last forum 
folks. This is exciting. Um, I would love to introduce today's participants. We are fortunate enough to be joined by um, operational uh, operations lieutenant from the Pembroke Police Department, Rick McDonald. Good morning, sir. Morning. Uh, Pembroke Health Agent Lee Good morning, ma'am. Morning. And by Interim Fire Chief Ken McCormick of the Pembroke Fire Department. Good morning, Chief. Good morning, Sabrina. It's exciting there's going to be an emergency management meeting at 10, so in the interests of staying pithy here, um, <laughs> what do you anticipate, and I'll start with Lisa, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, you had some conversation last night with the Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. that I believe you'll bring forward in emergency yes. management. But if you could touch on some of those reveals, as well as what do you see the 10 a.m. meeting bringing out uh, with emergency management this morning? Sure. So yesterday at 4 p.m., um, I had a wonderful Zoom conference with the chamber. Um, it was driven out of the desire of the chamber members to help one another with COVID compliance. And we did kind of a walkthrough of the state reopening plan, the six steps that all businesses are supposed to have in place before opening or if already open, we're supposed to be in place by May 25th. Um, fortunately, by and large, many of the businesses participating had already done that um, and more than that, but there were certainly some gray areas and some questions we were able to go over. Also, we were able to work with some of the chamber um, staff and volunteers that we could answer some more in-depth questions about industries that might not be their own so that they could assist other people. We did um, have such a positive meeting with such wonderful information sharing and um, the ability to make things um, a little easier understood that the chamber very much wants to continue um, this series and is going to do so with the assistance of PAC TV. Um, and anyone who's interested in participating or has questions, I strongly urge them to reach out to the chamber, uh, reach out to the chamber VP. Unfortunately, the president has a little bit of a, a medical condition right now, so he is unavailable, but the vice president, Peter Brown, and many of their staff are all available to assist anyone. And um, I'm pretty sure PAC TV would be happy if someone needed to reach out to them as to how to, to zoom in and participate and ask these important questions. Um, continuing to focus on reopening Reopening, reopening compliance, um, what to do if you have an area of non-compliance, how, how might you correct that? And of course, moving forward, as phase two begins to roll out, that's going to start to include some more challenging industries to get back <coughs> online, such as food service industry and things like that. So we're going to shift the focus a little more from the, the six steps that everyone needs to do and into those um, higher level um, detailed plans, as well as phase two and phase three businesses and what that compliance is going to look like. Sabrina, we can't hear you. What were some of those commonly asked questions? And uh, sure, this, this, oh this yeah, has a mind of its own. By the way, so this is interesting. No to watch worries. Right off for no, no worries. Um, number one question. Number one question was um, how to work in a positive manner with employees to gain compliance out of employees that maybe don't want to wear a facial covering. Um, and how to work with the other end of the spectrum, employees that might be um, extremely frightened or nervous about returning to work. So we did a lot of grounds with that. And what was really awesome about the chamber is, of course, we have a couple of attorneys um, on that call as well that were able to shed a little light. Obviously, any business having those specific issues should be reaching out to their own um, human resources department if they do not have a human resources department. Certainly, they should have some sort of workers' compensation or insurance agency that they maybe work with that could help um, answer some of those questions, you know, fill in those gray areas. But the number one consensus on that topic of the meeting yesterday was follow all the six steps, document, document, document all those six steps that you've done, have your signage and everything else in place and make sure the employees as is required in the plan are aware of the policy. And, and every attorney and everyone in the human resources world that was on that call yesterday all agreed, those are the key steps to eliminating any, any potential employee issues. Is it gonna be perfect? No. Is it going to be one size fits all? No. Um, and, and many employers had already acknowledged, you know, that while they were bringing back, you know, the lion's share or the majority of their staff, there were some very individual specific 
staffing issues that they addressed on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, for example, someone with COPD that was on staff many years at, a, at an industry, while all everyone else is returning to work, they have made provisions for that particular individual to remain at home on a more extended period um, until you know they kind of see what the virus does. Another one was an issue with um, an employee that had longstanding um, situations that um, have young children and until there's a child care solution that employee was made a specific exemption um, and there were questions surrounding child care um, and, and bringing that back online um, and that that's something the state is addressing and, and supposedly is being addressed this week and will be in place before phase two so those were the number one questions thank you very much all right so now that you're starting to see uh, calls increase, walk, you know, not necessarily walk-ins yet, but uh, there's an anticipation as facilities open that there may be a need for uh, guidelines to be established on things like occupancy. Absolutely. That there's a thought that we are going to unlock the doors and people will walk in very orderly, follow the directions as laid out on the floor, wear their facial covering, conduct their business, and just leave. Um, if that were not to happen, uh, there's going to have to be further conversation. Is that correct? And what do you anticipate that would look like? Lisa, do you want to take that? Sure. I mean, the... the the phased opening isn't necessarily going to work for everybody. And as the phased opening moves forward, it's going to require different industries um, having to make special provisions to become in compliant. And it's going to require that they do all of those things. So it, it, it is going to be a bit problematic and it, and it is going to require um, some specific handling. Okay. I mean, is the recommendation at this point to a point to point person Please. I would. If I was a small business owner, of course, if you don't have a human resources person, you should have someone that you can appoint, affix, or, or whatever to take on that roles and responsibilities. And the attorneys did allude to that um, in the call the other day. Okay. So now I am a business owner and I need to partner. My first thought, based on our previous forums, um, and this this is going to go to you, Lieutenant, um, <laughs> that uh, if I have an issue with a patron who I may want to disinvite my establishment because of some issue that we may be having, um, and again, this would probably be the outlier. People are eager to get back into, into the swing of things. They want to comply. But if I'm a business owner and I need to partner with someone, what is your recommendation? Hi, so, I am so sorry. Um, unfortunately, I did not catch that. Because it was for the lieutenant. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good. I'm going to stand down. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. So uh, I think it's a little bit different when you call the police. If you're the proprietor of the of business, in this case, probably the manager on duty, uh, you'd probably be the point of contact, whoever is the uh, person in charge. And now I need to get someone else involved. Let's say I have done my best in my establishment, but I'm just not successful with this patron. What is the recommendation? Call us. Call us and we'll come there and help resolve the issue. Okay, so the non-emergency line at the police department, that would be? 781-293-6363. Very good. Um, is there any thought of uh, actually setting up a, a, a route for that? I mean, I know right now, and this one, I'm sorry, Lieutenant, would probably go back to Lisa. Um, some of these compliance issues, Lisa, as they're posted in the uh, public domain, involve DLS as the arm for reporting if I see something and I want to talk about uh, mm -hmm. the state required templates that need to be posted and so forth and compliance. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the state um, from the outset um, d created a hotline um, with the Department of Labor Standards. Um, that number is available on the state website for anyone that might need to make use of it. Um, you go ahead and you you call in and um, the, the the person answering the phone would take down your information. <clears throat> what is the violation? What business, what community is that in? And then they would dispatch that complaint um, to the Board of Health in that community for enforcement action. Um, this The state's mandated phased um, uh, so resolution, if we want to call it res resolution plan, is first of all to have a uh, on-site visit that uh, is an educational in format. For example, is the business in non-compliance because they didn't know um, and, and require education? And that's the first step. 
Um, if the, the violation remains on a second visit is a $300 fine on the third visit is an additional fine and on a fourth or subsequent um, issues, the state mandates that the business then be closed. Understood. Um, up until now, Lieutenant, it's my understanding that Pembroke police has always taken the educational approach. Is that true? Can you give us maybe an example or a hypothetical even? You're coming in uh, a little bit broken up, but I think I get the gist of it. Um, again, we're, we're in this to assist people in any facet. So uh, if it's just a question or if it's guidance, uh, there are legal standpoints that we'll enforce still. Uh, we still are police officers and uh, we're more like social workers today, but we can switch that right over to the uh, aspect of law enforcement. But call us, any concerns, we could direct you in the right path and give you a, at least that for direction. Thank you. Um, all right, so today's meeting at 10 o'clock. Um, emergency management will go through a series of updates uh, from the last meeting and go into some more detail on what these reopening strategies and secondary plans for industry-specific uh, facilities may look like. Um, information as it comes through, Lisa, comes through from the governor, mm -hmm. from DPH. How, mm -hmm. do, how, are, how is the team receiving the information? Because they're going to have to process that in 45 minutes. Go ahead. Um. I really wish you hadn't asked that question. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> unfortunately, the number one complaint of every health department on receiving information regarding reopening, reopening compliance, um, and templates, unfortunately, is coming to us via the governor's conferences on the news, um, like everyone else. And the challenge that creates for local health departments is the governor will often reference in his new um, requirements or guidelines to reach out to your local boards of health for assistance with this. And of course, we are getting this data live and on the air. We don't usually get this data from the state until I've had some be, be more than 24 hours after uh, the governor's address. And so that creates a huge problem for us because needless to say, the minute the governor releases a new piece of information, everyone is calling looking for guidance and assistance, which we simply don't have in our hands yet. Um, it's been the number one concern of health departments. So moving forward, regarding the noncompliance that's being reported to the um, Fair Labor, I, I can't say is how that's going to arrive. I would presume if it follows the protocol that the other DPH communications have come with, um, that it will come via email uh, to the communities. Hopefully it comes in a timely manner um, so that we can act to it appropriately. Understood. I mean, I know this office, the Office of the Board of Selectmen, are very focused on what kind of information we're going to get from the state, from the Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission regarding some actions being taken ironically on the Cape because they'll go first. They want their seasonal facilities open as soon as they can. They're on a limited schedule. I think the last time I heard they have 19 weeks to make all of the, um, you know, um, money that they're going to use for, for 52. So, they are very eager to see some changes to longstanding regulations regarding allowing alterations of premises. As we go forward, and the chief, who I'm going to go to in a second, Chief McCormick, I hope you're still there. <laughs> I <am. laughs> lost you in the he process is. because this is getting a little crazy over here. But uh, some of these, you know, the town is going to have to exercise some very quick and fluid local options for temporary changes. I mean, mm -hmm. some of these facilities to survive are going to need to get some tables outside. They're going to need to consider how does the regulation that just was passed allowing our, um, you know, pouring restaurants to sell packaged liquor affect their ability to pour on the sidewalk slash outside area that they have set up for seating. So um, I know everybody's watching it from a different vantage point, and that's one of the reasons that this coming together and, ha and sharing this information on a local level can be invaluable. If there's a gap in one piece of information, maybe we can fill it in on another, and I know that that's a a crazy thing to say, but I think this event, this entire COVID stretch has taught us a lot about communication and how quickly things move. So sorry about that. Back to the chief. Chief McCormick, you had an opportunity to meet with the planning board and have some conversation about their expectations on what emergency management and the town would be allowed to um, create, so to speak, out of nothing, out of thin air, uh, to assist business. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So I met with them a week ago or so, um, discussing the very the very issues that we had at our meetings that when phase two came and restaurants opened, how were we going to deal with that? 
Um, obviously, if you're going to go through the planning board for a site plan approval or change, that takes public meetings, which some of these businesses you just stressed don't have time for. They're probably a month away from going out of business. So in our discussion, we kind of streamlined it to the Board of Health, the Fire Department, and uh, the Building Department to get these businesses open under a temporary permit. And then Planning Board would review what we kind of approved to make sure that it was okay for them, but they had no issue with us doing the, the site plan approval portion of it. And then we would allow, uh, well, we would, we would give the information to Matt, uh, who is their agent, uh, secretary, and he would then review it and get back to us if there are issues. Um, so as you said, we're trying to streamline the process to get these guys open so that they can start to make some money. We can start to get back to whatever our new normal is, but, they need to understand too, as you just stressed, pouring alcohol on a sidewalk, creating spaces that weren't there before. There's very, very little room for non-compliance. Uh, there isn't four chances, five chances. It's one, here you go, you need to correct it. And then if you can't correct it, we're just gonna have to shut that particular portion down. Um, we just don't have the time to continue to go back and forth if they're not gonna be compliant. But we're here to help, we're gonna try to get these businesses open um, under that phase and, and whatever other businesses need to be inspected. We're ready to go do that. We started inspections at the firehouse for residential um, back on the 26th of May um, so that we could get that phase going. So we're, we're starting to get back to some type of a normal situation. Understood. Thank you very much. And that is important to stress. There are hundreds, if not over a thousand businesses in this town. And so many of them will require just a little bit of fine tuning and potentially these temporary creative solutions to help them get going. So everybody really has to be patient and they have to cooperate to the best of their ability to do that. Um, and I really thank you for pointing that out because that's important to remember. Which, which, I, which I don't think would be an issue because everybody so far has been spectacular. Um, so I, I think they're going to do what they have to do to open and, and get ready uh, to, to get to the new norm. Um, but we just need to put that out there, that these are temporary permits uh, that need to be adhered to, because uh, myself, the police department, and of course, Lisa, just we don't have the time or the manpower to go out and continuously, you know, reinspect or, or guide them in the right direction. It's a, it's a one or two time thing, and then that's got to be the end of it. No, that's perfect. Thank you, sir. Um, I wanted to throw back to Julie in the studio and find out if we have any questions coming in. I know it's the last day, and I hope that that's not going to be a, a shock to anyone. But uh, we do have, as uh, Ken and Lisa and Rick have alluded to, an awful lot right here going on. And it's going to become a little bit more challenging when we start unlocking things. So, Julie, are there any questions that have come in at this point? There's a couple. Um, one is for um, Deputy Chief a fire chief about um, the water situation and how that um, is handled with um, potential fires and you know pressure water pressure etc so uh, we were in contact last week with uh, Gene the water superintendent um, due to the hydrant issue and the water supply the pump the well pumps that we had that were down uh, we formulated a plan um, as as the acting chief, I went through and got a tanker task force that would come to the town of Pembroke. I had uh, Indian Head Pool in Hanson set up to deliver 18,000 gallons of water on a phone call. We put that plan into place Friday afternoon uh, after I left and went home, hoping never to use it. And unfortunately, <laughs> uh, we, had a, we had a house fire at 9 o'clock that night, uh, which put that plan into place perfectly. Uh, it worked absolutely spectacular. The town of Plymouth and Cava both came uh, with their tanker task force, uh, worked that out tremendously. We called Indian Head Pool. They were ready to come. We ended up not needing them because the guys here made a quick, fast attack and were able to knock the fire down, uh, getting everybody out of the house safely, uh, no injuries. Um, so some of the best well-played plans uh, that go into action that you put into place, sometimes you have to use, sometimes you don't. Uh, speaking with Gene, the water situation is getting better every day. Uh, we're hoping to, by Monday of next week, uh, be back up and running to full force. And every day we're getting stronger and stronger where uh, hydrants will, will be able to be used 
adequately uh, probably within the next three or four days in the near future. Uh, so, but we do have a plan in place. There is no safety issue with water uh, for fire protection. Um, we just, we, you know, we just need to kind of let Gene do his thing and get those get those wells fixed and back up online. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there was a question about um, the elections and town meeting. Um, the elections are still going to be held on 620, and town meeting has now been um, put off till 623. Is that correct? That's one week more than it was going to be Tuesday night, 623. The correct. question is, um, what about the what about the amount of people that can gather in one place? Are we <coughs> are we not following that? Basically, is what the viewer is asking. Well, I mean, I know this will go immediately to Lisa and not Pasco, but I wanted to start by saying that uh, watching the selectmen really um, listen and work with emergency management and the town moderator and the town clerk last night was really um, something to appreciate. I did appreciate all of the hard work that went into that dialogue because to your point, Julian, to the, the questioner's point, uh, that will continue to be a struggle. And the town has financial needs. There are certain economic deadlines um, some of them have been extended, but some of them have other implications for the town, and that has to be balanced with the ability of the town to, as we turn to Lisa, execute a town meeting with a, we know what we have to have, but we don't know what we could get. Um, so, Lisa, would you love to take, the, take this one now? Sure. That would be great. It is the struggle, in, in it, and that in graduation are the number one struggles for every community uh, in Massachusetts that has come up time and time again on the state conference calls. Um, and it, it is the greatest challenge that every community is having. Every community is having an enormous issue with how to not honor their graduates um, appropriately and everything else with everything else they've lost this year. And, and that's a real hardship emotionally for a lot of communities. And then the other part is, is town meeting because many communities don't have the ability to push everything. For example, as Ms. Chilcott alluded to, the fact that there are some items that have been in de and deadlines that have been extended by the state. But for example, a town like ours that has a capital improvement project that cannot wait, um, that cannot move forward without a, a, an affirmative town meeting vote is a challenge that it really can't be gotten around. So to directly to the, to the caller's point, yes, Putting that number of people inside of a structure is an issue. Um, the governor and the governor's office is aware that some communities have done this and may have to do this. I know that this community is even looking at out, an outside gathering, which would not be in non-compliance with the governor's order. Um, if, if the town moves forward inside, it will be with the social distancing. The selectmen heard very clearly and understood the need for that. But the problem is, is how do we do the mandatory business of, of running a community um, that is run by town meeting without having a town meeting? Um, the, the 112 budget will handle the routine protocols, but again, the, the necessary and deadline capital improvement projects um, would not be able to move forward, and that's going to, to have serious ramifications for the town. As a matter of fact, just as a follow-up to Lisa, sorry to jump in. Some people may not be aware that some of the articles being brought forward are technically, they're, they're financial, but not because of a budget situation. The governor has made an allowance for a 112 provisional budget for FY21. But to close 20, there are, in fact, water treatment plant uh, requirement. We have to appropriate some additional money to finish the water treatment plant upgrade. Um, that has not yet been allowed by the DOR to, to have a lower board of selectmen vote to execute. Um, and additionally, we're waiting for legislation from uh, the governor to allow for a local adoption of the FEMA flood maps. The, fl the National Health, uh, Flood Insurance Program that every resident of Pembroke enjoys and all of our surrounding towns as well is, is predicated on this new set of maps from FEMA <coughs> being adopted by this town before July 23rd, 22nd rather. And it's not enough to just vote them. You have to submit them to the um, Secretary of State's office in order to have them validated. 
And that timeline is going to be incredibly problematic unless legislation is in fact passed, which it, it's proposed, it's pending, it's being deliberated. But like everybody else, I know that there's some struggle on the House and Senate side um, about their own meetings and their own vote protocols and how to go back to committee and make those changes, then bring them forward again. I mean, what people have been able to get done is remarkable. But there are, as we've seen in so many aspects, more things that need to get done in order for everyone to stand out. Um, so a town meeting is going to be important for Pembroke. Um, and uh, it's not all matters financial re relating to the budget. Sorry to throw that out there, Julie. No, that's okay. It's it's really, it's quite confusing. And all of our, our four towns are absolutely struggling with this. It's, it's, it's. It it's very difficult for the, the people that are working in our towns that are trying to keep our towns going um, to weigh that against the people that are concerned about the spread of the virus. And both sides have absolutely legitimate points. And it's, 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 not, an, it's, it's not black and white by any, by any, any stretch of the imagination. Another question was about um, the 112 budget. Some, someone said, what actually is that? And what if the federal government ends up giving monies to towns that we could use in the future if we already have voted on, I think what they're saying is if we have town meeting and we vote and then we get money that we didn't know we were gonna have, how does that play into the budget and capital expense and all that? I'm glad you asked, because uh, the new town manager, Bill Chenard, last night did uh, reference this in his budget presentation to the selectmen. He presented a revised FY21, and that's fiscal year 21. Uh, that would begin July 1st and end June 30th of, of 2022. Um, he presented a set of numbers to go into the fiscal cycle because we only know what we know today. We do not know what could happen tomorrow, next month. We don't know what revenue changes will happen <clears throat> for things like meals tax, which may sound small, but is $300,000 a year. That's multiple teachers, firefighters, police officers, it could have dramatic impact. So we do the best, and by we, I mean the finance team in town, certainly not me, hallelujah, but um, they do the best that they can with the information they have. The they time. take a look at where we're trending, they analyze that, they take a look at where tomorrow's trend is going, they analyze that, they refine those numbers, they bring them forward, and Bill brought up the caveat, the thing that you're referencing now. We are going to have another town meeting. We're probably going to have multiple town meetings. So mm -hmm. articles that were proposed back when the warrant was open in January and February are still there. They're just not coming forward on the essential warrant, which is this first town meeting out of the gate, right? You're trying to figure out how to safely execute a gathering. You want to bring only the most important things you must get done to the forefront on that shot. But there will be multiple town meetings, whether it's the, and originally the timeline looked like it could be August, September, and then another one, October, November. We just don't know. The longer this gets delayed and we push it to the end of June, maybe we go to July, maybe September, maybe November, there is a going to be a need to fine tune these numbers. And yes, the hope is that the uh, CARES Act funding comes through for Pembroke and every other community. And we can start applying that to our COVID related expenses, which will change our overall f uh, financial landscape. And that will require some tweaking at a future town meeting. There will be adjustments as we go. There isn't really a better way to do it. And I know every other town struggles with these same concepts and thoughts. And um, so far, it looks like everybody's moving forward in a really appropriate way. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? Budget concerns, anyone? <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so, Sabrina, for the people of town, we, we usually have a um, town meeting um, kind of an update we used to have with the town manager where we'd go through the, the different articles. He'd come here to PAC TV. We'd just go through the article and he'd explain what they are. Um, how can people get um, the, the bare essential articles that need to be voted on, as you're saying right away, how can people get information on that? And, and if you vote this way, this happens. If you vote this way, this happens, the way we've been doing for years and years. Well, I'm sure that that is still a possibility. I mean, that's one of the things that uh, I know that the new town manager has found himself moving very quickly, um, <clears throat> perhaps more quickly than under normal circumstances as he transitions into a new role. Um, but Pembroke's been really good. He seems to be amazingly um, competent and strong, and he's been uh, connecting with all the right people. And uh, yeah, I think he's ready to go. I mean, he has a revised fiscal 21 budget now. So 
um, to your point, I think that's going to be a possibility to get that out on camera and start pumping that out through our uh, connected sites if uh, PAC TV can support us in getting that message out. Regarding the actual bare bones articles, we now have a warrant. That was as of last Selectman's uh, meeting on May 20th. They had agreed to a streamlined or abridged warrant. The original total of articles was in the 46, 47 article range. Um, it's been brought pared down to 17 essential articles, 15 essential two citizens petition articles. And um, those article warrant articles have been reviewed by advisory and the board of selectmen. Town council has weighed in on language and recommendations are being finalized with the thought that they were going to be forward or presented for June 16. Mm -hmm. That means that we would have been in a cycle where we would have been promoting that document now. We would have been pushing it out now. With the extra week, we want to make sure that advisory has a chance at their meeting tonight to finish up the work they need to do um, and actually drill into some of the detail they want to execute on. And they also have a meeting June 1. So they advisory is meeting both tonight, May 28, and Monday, June 1. Um, the meeting tonight is at 6 o'clock on Channel 15. The meeting on June 1 is at 7 o'clock on Channel 15. Uh, they also take questions during their meetings. So anyone who wants to contribute or weigh in or have dialogue can also do it through that forum. Um, once those have been wrapped, um, and we're looking at probably Tuesday uh, of next week, um, we hope to be able to have the, the ability to push that warrant out. Part of the problem we're going to have, Julie, is that the warrant has very specific language in it, particularly at the end when uh, they affix their signatures. There's dates and times that must be honored in a document like that. And that date has just changed. I'm actually redoing and changing the language for the date change right now. And, right, and honestly, since the dialogue last night with uh, emergency management and the board of selectmen and the moderator and the clerk was we'll revisit it on Wednesday. Um, I'm not even certain at this point that June 23rd is etched in stone, but I do know that the, the, the preference is to complete some of this work before the end of June. Mm. Um, so to your point, we'll push those as soon as they're capable of being pushed out. And hopefully we can get a show with the town manager to go over those articles. Yeah, Thank because you. because I think, as we've always said every year, is come to town meeting armed with information. That is not the, the place to, to learn about something the, for the first time. So I think the more educated we can make um, all of our residents, and, and I'm a Pembroke resident, full disclosure, um, the of more course. we can do to make sure people really understand the ramifications of these are the 10 or 12 or 15 articles that we have to vote on. This is all the information you need to know. Ask your questions beforehand. Um, get your information beforehand if possible so that the voting, if you do have to have a meeting, you can do it as quickly and as, um, as efficiently as possible to get people in and get them out. That would be Agreed. the goal, correct? Absolutely okay. agreed. And I know that there was a lot of conversation about this just as Bill was arriving, right, uh, Mr. The new town manager. Yes. Um, we do have, to, you know, an, a need and a desire to expand on communicating prior to these meetings, uh, these town meetings, having more uh, public hearings, bringing these things out, being able to make all. Oh, we lost you again. We lost you. Audio's gone, Sabrina. She doesn't know her audio has gone. <laughs> but she's very passionate about what she's, she's saying. She's very passionate about what she's, she's saying. Just, so I, I will. I will. Sabrina. Okay. So she doesn't know we can't hear her. We can't okay. hear her. We couldn't hear the last one minute of what you said. This, this has a mind of its own. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, being it really to consolidate it and move it along, you're right. And okay. uh, the, the desire was always to move to more public hearings and get this word out because communication gets better and better every day. The way to do it and the methodologies, improving technology is incredible for this. Um, the new town manager is very excited to do that. He was really coming in the door, hitting the ground running on pushing forward some of these changes. And COVID has really changed the landscape for so many people. So, it, you know, as we go forward, you will see more of that, Julie. And I'm, I'm really glad, you know, to hear that. Yes. A second town meeting, for example, let's say we have to go again in August or let's say it's September. One way or another, those will be more um, orchestrated. They will be more transparent. They will be more promoted. Um, we'll have more time. Um, the town manager has, in fact, been here for less than a month. We have actually had him for, this is his third week. So, 
uh, things are going well, but uh, they aren't perfect yet. Right. Thank you. And I just want to um, bring everybody to notice the, the town website, which has been really, really updated wonderfully. I want to bring that up. Um, if, you, if you go to this, the new, um, the red banner has so much information. If you, if you just go through it about phased reopenings, about, um, and if you see all these, um, like the control template for businesses is right here. What do you have to do if, if you're opening a business? There, everything you need to know basically is on this website. You've done a tremendous job. Okay, guys, you can pull that down. Um, and I assume, Sabrina, that all the updates, daily updates, will be put in the same place? So there's one Absolutely. place people can go? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why emergency management, and I don't want to speak for them, it's not fair, but I don't see a, a climate at this point where they stop meeting. I mean, this is where the information comes together. All these sources of information are married together and analyzed by the people that you count on, fire, police, health. They're coming together to share this information, put it into a composite, and send it out to be disseminated. Right. It's a team effort. It's a team sport, and uh, I'm really proud of everybody. This has been an interesting road. They've, we've, Pembroke has always done well in a crisis. This is when we shine. We really are amazing in an emergency. But this has been a very long-duration event, right? So it's had its peaks. It's had its valleys. It's had its quiet times. It's had its spikes. And, um, and I'm really proud of everybody. And I, I thank everybody. This was a really, really good run. And, uh, and it will continue, to your point, Julie, to be updated every day. There's still a case banner. Mm -hmm. um, the old banner that was there before that showed daily case updates still lives on that page. It's just below the fold. So if you subscribed for that urgent alert, you continue to receive those case updates every time they're posted. And we're posting them every day. There has been one or two times when the cases were zero on a Sunday that I, I think that we missed the zero post. Uh, we went back and backfilled it. So those posts will always be forthcoming. If you've subscribed through the front page of the website for <coughs> notifications, when those pages are updated, you will receive an immediate email with the link to the update, and it will show in your either text or email screen. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and as, as I said to you, although this is the last scheduled uh, COVID-19 forum we'll have for the town of Pembroke um, on Thursday at 9 a.m., uh, and we date stamped everyone we had. So if you ever want to go back and look at them at pactv.org slash Pembroke, you can see the progression of, of the information that has been passed and what date it was passed on. But anytime Pembroke, any department needs um, a forum or a, a get together where we can have certain people getting together to get, push out certain information, we obviously, that's what we're here for, that we, we are your partner in, in sharing of information. And did anybody want to go around and give a last, a last hurrah or a last b word of advice as we go into kind of a real new beginning for next week? I would love it if, Julie, if you let us do that. That's, that's going to be a really heartfelt thing. And uh, as we go through the group, uh, starting with you, Lieutenant McDonald, um, as we, you know, s slowly shut down the forums for the time being, what are you hoping Pembroke took away from this experience and what would you like to say? Well, we uh, show that we are more resilient than people realize going through such a um, bad time and to continue to do the good things that we're doing. And I want to thank Julie for giving us the platform to inform our residents and keep them up to date along with you, Sabrina, as the ringleader. I thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Chief McCormick, uh, what would you like to say? You, you were wrapping up. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Um, again, uh, thank you, Julie and Impact TV. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, hopefully the uh, residents got something out of the seven, eight, nine weeks we've been doing this, whatever it's been. Um, you know, we were able to inform them and give them uh, some, you know, guidance and where to go in, in, in how to do certain things. Um, uh, and and thank you to the team. I said everything's been, and been pretty good. Uh, the town has absolutely stepped up and done everything that's been asked of them. Uh, so hopefully we can transition to a nice smooth opening and, and a, the new norm uh, and, and get back to uh, get back to the people's business. Lisa, <laughs> hit it. <laughs> I, I wish I could say it was, it was going to be goodbye, Julie, but I know that it's just farewell for now because um, we have the whole business uh, reopening plan to work on. But but as far as the, the residential portion of it, you know, a thank you to the residents for being so patient. A thank you to Tech. PAC TV for being so cooperative on getting the messages out. Um, a thank you to uh, an amazing group of individuals that I've had the privilege of 
working with the entire Pima team, um, you know, including the, the people sitting here with me now, but uh, also our, our COA director, our housing director, uh, our recreation director, people that you wouldn't normally think of in an in event like this that have stepped abo up above and beyond to make this event easier. Um, I would not have wanted to address this situation missing any of these individuals because it would have made my job significantly harder. So thank you to them. Thank you to the residents um, for working so hard to be compliant. Thank you to the business owners that I've dealt with being so exceedingly patient as they're working so incredibly hard. Um, so that the final word for me would be kindness goes a long way and kindness to one another kindness to people trying to maneuver their way through these very unusual times um, kindness will will ser serve us all far better than than getting angry and frustrated so when in doubt if you can be patient and kind I think that'll work thank you Lisa and uh, as I say goodbye and thank you for your patience every Pembroke resident needs to know that I and everyone here that I have spoken to or worked with throughout this entire duration of event thanks you because Pembroke residents have been amazing. Not only have they been flexible mm -hmm. and fluid, but they've been patient and they've been calm. And to Lisa's point, they've been kind. We're on the phones, we're answering questions, we're trying to cobble together solutions for the unsolvable, we are working with everybody, and people have continuously just given us their um, kindness and their fortitude and it really does help make the day go better and help strengthen the team as a whole. So Pembroke is in a pretty amazing place to live and a pretty amazing place to work. But just as a quick goodbye and a thank you, uh, the forum wants to thank um, Plymouth County District Attorney Tim Cruz for participating in the forums, State Representative Josh Cutler for his valuable insight and participation um, on Tuesdays with the team, uh, School Superintendent Aaron Obi for joining on Tuesdays and really helping to get the word out about the school system and what the, they anticipated for their load. And um, Pembroke Emergency Management Agency members everywhere, including the ones here today, um, but that would include Gretchen Emmett's Council on Aging Director, John McEwen, Executive Housing Authority Director, Health Agent Lisa Cullity, who has been amazing every single day when she's <laughs> in here swinging for the fences, Operations Lieutenant of the Pembroke Police Department, Rick McDonald, for his patience, fortitude, and being very succinct and brief when he updates us, because that's what we do. And um, Fire Chief Ken McCormick, who keeps us on task and keeps us focused and very direct. And we, uh, we like knowing where we stand, and we have really enjoyed doing this. And um, the last person and group I want to thank are the ones that we were not going to stop working with. And that's PAC TV, Julie, and all of her team, because as we sunset the forum for the time being, boards are going to start to meet again, and we're going to be relying on the, the Zoom platform that's provided to the town of Pembroke by PAC TV, our partner in cable access television. So I want to thank Julie and thank everyone. And I, uh, I want to throw back to <laughs> she's gone <laughs> and she just faded right out um you're welcome we we at pack tv we're all we're, our team is this is what we do and we're so happy to bring the information that comes from the people that actually know so that's what's really important i think is get your information from the people who know the people who are doing the jobs um we will ha we'll have forums again as needed uh, i'm sure we'll we'll be speaking about town meeting um pack tv has um recorded the uh, Board of Selectmen candidates that are running, the, there's three of them running for two positions. We've recorded um, some statements and questions for them, which are uh, available on our website. Same thing with people that are running for any other um, office. We used to have everyone be able to come into PAC TV and make a three minute candidate statement for anyone who was running for office. Um, now we're having them do them remotely and send them into us. So everyone had that opportunity. If they're running for a position where there's actually um, is a race, if there's one person running for one seat, then they don't have to do a, a statement, but they can. All those statements can be um, viewed at pactv.org. So we thank you for joining us. Please stay safe, stay healthy. Listen to these people we have in Pembroke because they are the best. This is Julie for PAC TV signing off. <laughs>